Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Troubleshooting and Testing Your Floor Heating System for the Season. If you haven't noticed, it's been getting chilly here in the Midwest. Maybe you're not in the Midwest, you don't know that, but it is getting cold and that means it is time for people to turn their systems on for the first time. My name is Scott and today I have with me Anatoly here. And we're both in the technical support department and we'd like to th thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask a question. You can hit the ask a question button at the bottom of the page and uh, we'll be glad to answer that question as time permits. And uh, we have some questions that have already been sent in. So that's good, we'll be answering them also. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a look at our controls because sometimes the system just isn't um, controlled correctly. Maybe it's not, there's nothing wrong with the system per se, but maybe the schedule is messed up. Maybe that comes on in the middle of the night instead of comes on in the middle of the day. So it's very important to get the thermostat or your control system set up correctly. That's why we're going to be spending time on the controls to make sure that we're all familiar with them. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do an initial setup with our touch thermostat, which is what mo most people are using these days. And then we'll be going over some troubleshooting and how to figure out what's going on with your floor. And uh, as Anatoly and I know, whenever you have a problem and the floor doesn't heat and your control is good, the first thing we're going to ask you is to, what are the ohms of the system? So if the one thing we want you to get a takeaway from today is to be familiar with how to do ohms readings because that is the main way to troubleshoot floor heating systems. So um, Anatoly, tell us about the touch a programmable thermostat and why we suggest it. So uh, having a programmable thermostat, uh, that's kind of your best way to control the system. And first of all, to control the system efficiently and kind of get that best level of comfort. Uh, you typically uh, would want to have a thermostat in each room that you're heating. That way you control each room individually. Uh, meaning that you no longer need to kind of have the whole house or the whole level of the house at the same temperature. And that just makes, once again, makes the operation easy and makes your uh, energy savings go up. Right. What about showers, too? Um, a lot of people like to heat showers and bathrooms. Why would a shower, why would we recommend that a shower be on its own control? Uh, having a shower on its own control uh, pretty much may benefit uh, benefit the customer to get that precise level of uh, temperature because uh, shower floors would typically have a little thicker uh, sort of layering, right? So the temperature of the shower floor may be different. And simply, you know, having the uh, hot water running in the shower will get that floor nice and warm. And, uh, you know, you simply may not need to run that uh, floor that long as the rest of your bathroom floor. So having separate control will give you that great uh, kind of dedicated level of comfort just for that floor and of course separate one for the bathroom. I think the most people would feel the most impact is if they're if they've done a shower bench is getting the shower bench warm because the last thing you want to do is to sit on an ice cold shower bench and um, usually those are thick and the reason why um, you'd want to have its own thermostat is because you probably, since it's the thicker the product you're heating, the longer it takes to heat. So you may want to turn that thermostat actually on a little bit earlier than the rest of the floor to make sure that it warms that seat. So if you ever have to sit down on there, you're not really, really cold. Um, also, and it's an important thing to, to remember that um, this type of heating is definitely a zone control. This is a situation where you don't want to put one thermostat in one room and have it control the whole house because the benefit of electric floor heat is that you can zone each particular room. And if that room is not going to be on for a week, there's not going to be anybody in that room, like a downstairs basement, there's no reason to have it on. So, and that also lets you turn the temperature down in the rest of the house and warm the area that you are in. So living room at night, um, you know, kitchen in the morning, that sort of thing. So it's very, very important to think about that, especially if you've never had radiant heat or electric radiant heat before, is the ability to zone it. So uh, talking about that, what can a person uh, expect when it comes to electric floor heating? So yeah, if you've never been in the room with uh, just nice toasty uh, warm floor from electric floor heating, 
the very first thing you're going to be noticing is first of all that comfortable temperature coming from the floor right the whole floor heats up it pretty much acts as your main heat source you know it heats up it starts to transfer that heat into the objects in the room into the people in the room and the good thing about the radiant heat transfer it does not really heat up the air so you don't have that uh, you know hot pocket of air sitting by the ceiling and just uh, being lost through the cracks and stuff you just efficiently transferring that heat from the floor into that couch here into that table here and all the room kind of just gently warms up and as the objects in the room warm up they will give off temp uh, warmth to the the rest of the room too so that's very very important when it comes to this product the one thing i've when i've talked to, to a new homeowner uh with a new system is they expect to walk into a bathroom and feel hot, hot air hitting them they expect it to be like standing in front of an oven but really it's you walk into the room and all of a sudden in, in two or three minutes you start to feel warm the air isn't really any warmer it's just you are this because the radiant yep. floor heating is actually heating you and what's so good about this product is it's wet location listed so we can put it in shower floors and in benches so talk about these different controls that we have and what are uh we're going to be talking about them individually so kind of give us an overview here yeah so we we offer four main uh, models of the floor heating controls starting from the uh very simple and basic and trust model which is shown here on the lower right uh that's a non-programmable thermostat and going all the way up into our touchscreen models uh, with uh, Wi-Fi. So you can have a nice, easy operation and uh, remote operation through your smartphone. Let's talk about the least expensive unit. And kind of like the weird thing about this unit is the least expensive unit is usually recommended for the most expensive floors. And um, we'll understand why that is. So tell us about this Entrust thermostat. Yeah, so Entrust thermostat, uh, like I said before, that's a non-programmable thermostat. We also like to call it set it and forget it because, uh, again, the operation is very simple. You set it to the temperature you need, and it just stays at that temperature 24-7 until you change the set point or until you just shut the unit down. So it's really good for floors where that temperature should not be changed too often. So like hardwood or engineered wood or laminate. Uh, there's typically going to be some requirements, some restrictions, some limitations in terms of temperature swings and maximum temperature. So again, great unit for that. Uh, it's also good for just areas where seasonal heating is needed or simply like uh, my, my perfect example would be like a guest bedroom or guest bathroom where you simply have that unit maybe running for a couple of days in the winter, or maybe a couple of weeks in the winter. And then it just goes back to the uh, setback temperature. Right. So set it and then forget it. And, you know, if you've ever bought, um, uh, you th think about heating um, hardwood floors or heating carpet, some of them don't allow setback temperatures, which is what a, th it, a programmable thermostat allows you to, to set it for comfort temperature when you're there and to have it go to a lower temperature when you're not there, uh, sometimes 10 or 15 degrees different. But the thing is, some flooring manufacturers say you can only change the temperature one or two or three degrees per day. So that's where this unit is going to come in handy. That way, it never changes. You can set it and forget it, just like he said. So what about the enhanced thermostat? What is the main benefit of this unit? So enhanced thermostat, in general, that's already your kind of next level up. That's a programmable thermostat gives you kind of your typical programmable schedule throughout the week so you can get uh, those economy and comfort temperature set up just like scott mentioned a moment ago uh, but a kind of good feature in this unit that it can be set to work as a regulator meaning that you no longer relying on the temperature you just relying on simply a percentage of heating from a one to a hundred percent and the, the reason it's good is because there are lots of installations uh, in the field where an older style kind of dial type regulator is installed. And in case that regulator fails, you don't have a sensor to connect to one of those uh, temperature sensing units. So that particular model, the enhanced thermostat, going to be a great and kind of really the best replacement for it. Right. So the regulator is the key function 
for this one. <clears throat> and what we also need to make sure is everybody's aware is that the GFCI protection that's required by the National Electric Code for electric heated floors is supplied by the thermostat. So every single one of these thermostats supplies the GFCI required for your floor. And also, that's why you never want to install a GFCI circuit because you don't want a GFCI circuit breaker along with a GFCI protected thermostat. So um, that's what's called nuisance tripping. And, and um, I don't remember if we have a slide about nuisance tripping, but we might as well talk about it just real quick. Nuisance tripping is when the thermostat thinks that there's something with a, a wrong with the floor, but there isn't. Usually it's something that has to do with the electric that's feeding the thermostat. And sometimes that's caused by another GFCI on the same circuit, also uh, caused by another thermostat on the same circuit, or somebody put in the, the notorious one is putting a, an exhaust fan on the same circuit as the GFCI protected thermostat. That will give you nuisance trips all the time. That's really telling you there's nothing wrong with the floor. There's really nothing wrong with the thermostat. It's just the power it's getting isn't uh, up to snuff. So kind of went off topic there a little bit, but it's something that we need to talk about because it's a lot of the calls we get in the winter time. So talk to us about this unit. So Inspire Touch thermostat, that's, uh, that's our best seller. That's uh, the short thing I can definitely say about it. It's the unit that people love, right? It's, it has just one large display. It's a touch screen display. So operation uh, on that unit is extremely easy and it's just kind of just intuitive. I mean, it has a menu button. You go into the menu. Every single button has a name. You know where you are. You know how to make your changes, you know how to save your changes, you know how to just cancel and exit from the menu. Uh, I would say 99% of the time, you don't even need like an instruction on how to set it because it's just as easy as using your smartphone. So again, really great unit, really uh, simple in everyday operation or just that original setup uh, of the unit. Can this unit be turned on or off? That's a question we get every single day. How do I turn this unit off? I don't see an on off button. How do they do that? Yeah, yeah, great question. And we don't clearly see maybe that uh, button right on that particular image, but on the lower right corner, you can see we have that, uh, you know, that rectangle there pointing into the lower right side of the frame of the unit. That's where the button is. Uh, that's a GFCI reset button. When you press it just momentarily, it eventually just resets your GFCI. But when you press and hold that button for about five seconds, that actually shuts your unit completely down. Same exact process will uh, turn the unit back on if you press and hold it. Yeah, this time of year, we get questions from people that ask us the same question in the spring. How do I turn this off in the spring? And then they forget. What did I do again? I can't remember. I'm going to call you guys again. And that's why we're here. And simply press and hold that right side button down so that's thanks for bringing uh for for talking us through that one uh let's talk about the next unit and the wi-fi thermostat this looks very very similar to the other one yeah yeah very similar unit it looks the same it uh even has a very similar screen uh it will just have few additional indications on it but really yeah it's it's all the same screen it's all the same unit with that simplicity uh, of operation but of course in in addition to everything we just shared about that previous model you now have that wi-fi connectivity so you can connect that unit to your home wi-fi then set up your account and pretty much get that remote control set up and of course uh, since i was mentioning there's those additional uh indications on the screen you do have the weather indication, which is you know great to get your quick weather forecast visible. And it has a wireless indicator, so you know if your unit uh, is connected. And in general, you know it's your Wi-Fi unit. Right, and the question we get all the time is, what is that big number in the center, that, that temperature that shows up in the center? What is that temperature? Is that my floor temperature? Yeah, I like to say, uh, tell me what's your smaller number there on the upper left corner and a big number in the center. So yeah, your smaller number on the upper left, that's your current room or floor temperature, depending what your settings are. And the larger uh, number is your target temperature or your set point, set point temperature. All right, so let's compare and contrast these units from to each other and from each other. Yeah, uh, great comparison chart. Of course, you can see your Inspire Touch Wi-Fi uh, would kind of 
get all of these check marks, all of these features you typically would want for your top of the line floor heating thermostat, uh, then Anspire Touch will of course lose that uh, remote control uh, through the uh, phone. And then Enhance Model will not have the touch screen. It will not have that control via phone. And of course, Entrust, like we spoke before, that's a non-programmable unit. So you're just really just getting that basic simple operation uh, that you sometimes need on uh, lots of applications. The main takeaway on this uh, product is if, you're, if you have an older thermostat and you are replacing it with one of these new thermostats, the one that you can get or the two that you can get, they're going to fulfill about 99.9% .9 of the jobs and the thermostats that have historically been made, um, it, you have to worry about floor sensor compatibility. And floor sensor compatibility um, means that if this is not set correctly, your thermostat's not going to read the temperature correctly. So that's where you're going to 99% of the stuff that we've sold over the 25 or what are years we've been in business have mostly been 10K or 10, oh, it should be 10K ohms there. Um, then some just the minute share over 12K, which means 12,000 ohms. Um, so if you have a question, you need to ask, you need to ask, you need to figure that out because if you look over here, this one's only compatible with 10K ohm sensors, which means uh, historically some of the old Honeywell units and, and some of the newer OJ units. Um, 10 and 12 here, but you really want to go here for compatibility because you can set it custom. Uh, just the other day, I had somebody who had a 100K ohm sensor, and the only way to get them a new thermostat would be one of these two. So it's very important. We're going to ask you if you if you didn't buy it from us, where, did, where you bought it from and what type of sensor is installed so we can make sure we get you the right thermostat. So talk to us about the app for the Wi-Fi. What can you do? Uh Pretty much the app really uh, reflects uh, the same kind of the same approach, the same interaction as your main screen of the thermostat. So you can easily change your settings, you can change your schedule, you can just uh, review the status, GFCI status of your thermostat. Uh, in general, the, the application is available on uh, both iOS and Android. Uh, you can control up to 16 thermostats on the account. So that's really great for uh, larger installations or maybe even installation in two different places, you know, like a main residence and vacation uh, place. Uh, on that particular screenshot with the iPad, that's a web browser approach. So you can control it from a web browser as well and kind of see that nice dashboard of all of your units at a glance. So again, great way to control uh, even if it's a one unit or it's 16 units. Right, so it's a great, great way to be able to control. Like, I'm going to go home early from work. Oh, fantastic! I'm going to turn the floor up now, so you can do that. So let's talk about setting the system up for the first time. So when you get this, it's going to ask you a bunch of questions, and we're going to give you the answers now because invariably we get these questions all the time. I got this question. What? Do, how do I answer it? So um, what's the difference between ambient temperature and floor temperature? Yeah. So. The thermostat can be set kind of in those two, the two main, I would almost want to call it theory of operation, right? The, uh, it can work based on the room temperature sensor that is built in right into the unit and it's registering your room temperature, your ambient temperature, or it can use the floor temperature sensor that is installed in the floor and eventually feeds the information on what is the temperature of the actual floor. So here's a couple of really good examples on this operation. So if the thermostat is set to ambient, the floor won't heat if the room air temperature is above the set point. That just simply gonna result in cold floors. If room temperature controllers are required, of course, you would wanna set it to ambient. But then on the other end, if the warm floors are desired, no matter the air temperature in the room, let's just say you wanna maintain a good 82 degree temperature for, you know, for the whole evening long or in all the morning times, you would want to set it to floor. That's when, once again, the system going to be using that input from a floor temperature sensor. It will know what the temperature of the floor is and maintain that precisely. So the thing is, we hear from people who um, set it for ambient in the summertime, their floors are cold when they take a shower because the shower 
uh, the room has gotten awfully warm just by being the summer for one thing and taking a shower hour at the second. Uh, so it's exceeded the, the set point for the ambient temperature. So the floor stays cold. Well, we know that probably 80, 85% of our business has been to sell to people who want warm bathroom floors. That's what the lion's share of our customers are looking for. So if you want to make sure that you have warm floors in your space, the best thing to do is to set the product for floor because that's the temperature that you want to adjust and control. Now we have a question here. We have a few questions and we have a sensor, a floor sensor here. And um, I'm going to read this question, Anatoly, and I, I know I've received this same question a hundred times and I'm sure you have too. Um, the, and, and I'm pretty sure that you're gonna have the answer right off the bat. This is a <laughs> test. <laughs> So the temperature under, this is from uh, Rick. Rick says the temperature under a small rug in our bathroom floor is very warm, very toasty. But the rest of the floor is only warm and not to the same degree. What is happening? Why doesn't the floor exposed to the air feel as warm? And I've got a couple ideas because it's probably two things that have a lot to do with it. Yeah. But what would you say to Rick when he's got really warm space under a rug and the rest of the floor doesn't feel as warm yeah yeah very good question and it's good that we actually get that question from rick that's a really great example so for me personally kind of two two lights lit up here first of all one uh thing is definitely any floor uh any heated floor uh that has you know a section that is covered by a rug or covered by uh clothing covered by a basket will simply trap heat right so that heat doesn't escape anywhere that heat just being trapped there and warms up the floor more warms up everything what's on top of it more so if you lift it up yes it's definitely going to be very warm very toasty uh the question why not the rest of the floor is warm even if you may be setting that to a warmer temperature could be another sort of coincidence if that floor sensor we're talking about is installed right in the same spot where that rug is. What happens then is that floor sensor reads that high temperature. So theoretically, that floor sensor can read that it's 90 degrees, but if you're setting your floor to be nice and, uh, again, 82, 85 degrees can be nice and warm, but if you're setting that to 85, which is below that uh, level that the sensor is already reading, that would simply mean that floor may even never kick on, right? So it could be a combination of those two things. Yeah, if you if you set the temperature for 88 and the thermostat is under the rug, that area is going to get 88 where the rest of the floor may only be 80. And the system is going to be tricked. It's going to go, oh, the floor sensor says it's 88. I'm going to turn off now. Meanwhile, the rest of the floor is cold. That's also another reason why you wouldn't want to install install a sensor in your floor in an area that gets hit by sunlight because what happens is sunlight in the afternoon or the afternoon or the morning or whatever it is comes in and hits that spot where the thermostat sensor is that particular spot feels 85 degrees so the rest of the floor controller turns off the rest of the floor is ice cold and that's what you have going there so you might have one or two things going on there rick fantastic question um you're trapping heat and we always try to say stay away from foam backed rugs because foam has a lot of air in it and air is an insulator. So you'll want to either move that rug somewhere else, eliminate it, or get a rug that doesn't have a pre-attached foam back to it. Those are the secrets. So what I would do is I would just try getting rid of that mat. Um, you know, we get questions all the time, but I want to put this in my dining room, but I want to cover the entire floor with a rug. And then we have to ask, well, why would you do that? Because you just paid to get your floors warm and the rug's going to trap all the heat. So that's kind of what's going on there, Rick. And uh, hopefully you have a couple of things to try. That's your homework assignment for tonight. So thank you so much for asking that question. Oh, uh, and I just hit the wrong button. Uh, okay. Fantastic. I was scared there for a second. Uh, it's never happened to me before. So uh, let's talk about setting the thermostat up correctly, because historically we've had a lot of questions about this and it can affect the way your floor works. That's why we're talking about it in troubleshooting, because there might not be something wrong with your floor. It could be that the thermostat set incorrectly. So 
get us started out here. What's the first step? Yeah, so uh, the great thing about those uh, touchscreen and touchscreen Wi-Fi models is that the very first time you start that unit up, it could be a uh, homeowner doing that, could be an electrician doing that for the very first time, the unit will actually guide you through a list of simple questions to pretty much get those essential things set up, you know, get your language set up, get your uh, to do a system test, get your flooring type uh, put in. So the, 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 the goal here really is that the thermostat does all that for you. You don't need to sort of get a manual and go into the menu and search through, you know, number of settings to ensure you get everything uh, set up right, everything is checked. Once again, thermostat does that for you. It takes pretty much less than a minute. And then it's just going to give you a message that would say something like uh, your system is ready to heat the floor. So it, that's just how, how simple and great it all is. So here we can see where we've done. Uh, we have the three parts of the system being tested. The thermostat passes, the air room floor sensor passes, but the floor, the floor sensor says fail. What can cause that? Yeah, floor sensor fail would be an indication when the thermostat uh, brain, I'm going to call it, just don't feel, don't sense that floor sensor being connected. Could be a number of reasons. Could be simply that maybe uh, these wires are just connected to the incorrect terminals. It could be that the sensor may be just not connected at all. Or it could be that maybe that sensor got damaged. So one of those things will definitely trigger that floor sensor fail indication, which is, again, good thing to see that ahead of time and see that there is a problem to start kind of troubleshooting that. There's also one other big, big failure here, and that is people forgot to install the floor sensor. <clears throat> so if they forget to uh, install the floor sensor, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. So we're going to continue on and um, let's talk about how to test the GFCI. This elicits a bunch of phone calls because people don't really understand what we're doing here. So kind of explain that to us. We got, I, I got a bad connection here for a second, but I can uh, catch up on uh, testing the GFCI. And that's, that's a, I wanna say maybe a little tricky message, but the actual process is very simple. You uh, get to that point, the system gonna, uh, the screen gonna tell you, press the button on the top, and that's actually a tripping button, like a test trip button. So when you're pressing that button, the unit is being tripped by, its, by itself because you're pressing a button. It will give you a standard message that would say pretty much, you know, your GFI tripped, uh, reset your system. If it doesn't, doesn't help, contact the electrician. But once again, there's nothing to worry about here because you actually doing the trip yourself. It's not like your system trip because something happened. You did the trip yourself. All you need to do is hit the side button that we talked about earlier. It will reset it. And again, as long as it resets, it will just go to, back to normal to the rest of that setup wizard. And that's why we'll add ask you if you ever come with this question we'll ask when did it come up did it come up when you were setting the unit up did it come up when you're testing the button by pushing it at the top or did you just show up one day and it was it was showing you that message if you push the button or if you're doing the setup that's normal you're supposed to get that message so um, i think this one's pretty self-explanatory it lets you choose between fahrenheit and uh celsius and what about the distributor id we get questions about this all the time yeah, distributor ID is going to be just a unique step uh, for specifically Anspire Touch Wi-Fi model because that's the uh, number. And again, that number is actually 10266. You can see it right on the screen. But that number what uh, gives us sort of the connection between uh, your thermostat and the database. So we can see, let's just say if you call it a, a year later to ensure your unit is set up, or maybe you need to reset the password or one of those things, we can find your unit in our database, assist you in the best and most efficient way. Fantastic. So the answer to that is uh, 10266. So setting floor load. What is my floor load? How do I know this? There's two different things here. One of them, is this a replacement thermostat? And one of them is, is this a new installation? Why is that a different answer? Yeah, uh, 
If it's a new installation and if you have any paperwork or simply any connection to this project, uh, we can always find that number for you or even you may have that number already in front of you because it's right on the installation plan. So we kind of show here on the uh, lower right corner and that's actually where you will find it on your installation plan page. Uh, the floor load is shown for every single system. Uh, but to describe it more, floor load is simply amount of watts, the wattage of your floor heating system. You know, either it's 500 watts or 700 watts, but here it's shown in kilowatts, so you just need to divide that by a thousand. So that would be your kind of example for a new installation. If you're just replacing a thermostat for an older installation, and let's just say you don't have any paperwork or you just don't want to start looking for one, don't worry about it. Simply skip that number because, uh, skip that setting I meant, because that, that setting really has nothing to do with the operation or performance. This is simply to kind of track how many watts of electricity you use. So let's say if you specifically kind of keep in track of that, you can check it up a month later and see that number. Right. So it has nothing to do with the operation. A lot of people say, oh, I, I, my system's really 1,100 watts and I only put 600 watts in. Does that mean it's not going to get as warm? It has nothing to do with the way it heats because our thermostat, it turns on and off. It doesn't regulate voltage. So there's nothing that that number has to do with anything. So uh, keep that in mind. It just and, and just an FYI real quick, if your floor is 1,100 watts, that's 1.1 kilowatts. If your floor is 700 watts, that's 0.7. Very, very simple to figure that out. So let's talk about how is the Wi-Fi unit different? Yeah, another uh, simple step here in the uh, Wi-Fi unit is set up. It does not actually ask you for the floor load number by default because it has uh, additional piece of hardware in it that actually detects that number for you. So as soon as your system starts running, it actually detects if it's, uh, you know, 0.7 kilowatt uh, system or it's 1.1 kilowatt system. So just leave it on. Uh, that means that power meter going to stay on and uh, go to the next step because it will do all this calculation for you. Okay, and here's where we talked about the sensor before, and here's where you get to choose it. And if your floor doesn't heat correctly, or if it heats strange, or it gets to a certain point and then won't go any higher, probably has something to do with this setting. So what is the sensor type here, um, and why is the red dot next to default? Yeah, my, my simple answer for any calls like that, I would always ask, uh, did you install the floor sensor? Uh, that came with your package. And that would simply mean uh, that's a 10K default uh, sensor, and that's the selection you would wanna keep because eventually it's already pre-selected for you. Uh, the only other time, like Scott mentioned uh, earlier in the slides today, the only time you may need to select 12 or a custom, if you know that there's a different type of sensor was installed for that existing system, that maybe was installed 10 years ago and you have that specific sensor information or maybe you you recall or you have eventually that older style thermostat by you so we can uh, work with you over the phone and kind of uh, estimate what sensor that might be. So the question comes, what do I set it at? Leave it where it's set. Leave it at default. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's going to be the answer you are going to be looking for. So what about the um, this temperature limit? This is once again, your temperature won't get to it past a certain point. You set it for 87, it only gets to 82. Um, why is that? That's uh, always gonna be because of the this particular setting. That's a floor protection setting. And again, I really, Perfectly, to be honest, uh, I love that we have a thermostat that has that setting because that's what's going to protect your floor if it's all set right and if your flooring has a specific floor protection limitation. So if you do have a laminate and your laminate's floor protection limit is 82 degrees, yes, leave it at laminate. Uh, if you have some other type of flooring, maybe like a vinyl flooring or carpet that may have a different uh, temperature limit, but eventually there is still one. 
go to custom, set your specific custom floor protection level, and uh, that way you maintaining your uh, you know requirements that the flooring manufacturer gives you. But in many cases, probably what 80, 90 percent of the floor heating uh, will have a tile floor on top of it. That's where you really want to make sure you don't skip that setting or don't have your installer skip that setting because as you can see on the screen, default selection is laminate. So if you just quickly kind of go in through the setup wizard, make sure you don't skip that one because just like Scott mentioned a moment ago, if you're uh, if you have a tile floor, you set it to 87 degrees, but it just stays at 82 or barely under 82, that is very likely because that setting was uh, skipped. So yeah, check that out. You can always uh, access that setting back in the menu even after the installation and adjust it. Yeah, we also get a question because they're in here and that they will set for tile max 104. And it's because tile doesn't really have a limit. And so what that 104 is, is the maximum temperature that you can program. It does not mean that your individual floor is going to get up to 104. Some floors can't do that. Some floors over a very cold area with poor insulation and three exposed, uh, three exterior walls with a lot of um, overhead, like a, with a fireplace or with skylights, that sort of stuff, that floor literally can't get to 104. But 104 is the maximum that you can program it for. So always when you're buying carpet, when you're buying laminate, when you're buying LVT, is check and see what the maximum temperature is and then enter that on the system. And that way you will not void your warranty on your flooring. So let's talk about scheduling because back in the old days, as soon as October 15th hit, we would get hundreds and hundreds of phone calls from people saying, how do I program my thermostat? And in, in, the, in the five years or so that we've been selling this unit, very rarely do we get any calls about programming because it's just so much simpler than the old up, down, choose, okay, up, down, okay, you know, running through menus, that sort of stuff. This is so much easier. You can literally change this by just taking your finger and pressing the time. And that will open up, like if you press that like 6 a.m. at number one, if you press the 6 a.m. part, it opens the window. And what does that let you do? Oh, I mean, it's just it's just that, that scheduling, like you said, it's so, so great and simple on this unit. I like how you pointed out about going up and down and getting all these things done. The worst part there, and it's just just my, my memory, is you go through the whole setup, you click the wrong button, and then you need to start over again. That That's the thing that you don't want to do. And again, you don't need to do that on those touchscreen units because, once again, as soon as you go into your scheduling menu, which we're showing right here, all you need to do is you only need to tap and adjust the time and the temperature on the time slot you really need to make that change. You don't need to kind of go through the whole schedule. You don't need to go through all of those temperatures. You simply tap at the uh, time slot you need, like maybe that 6 a.m. Uh, time is too early for you. You tap it, you change it to 7 a.m., you change your temperature maybe to 85 degrees, hit a check mark, save it, and within, again, an, another five seconds of your time, you can click that copy button and copy that to the rest of the days of the week. Typically, if you're just uh, quick with the touchscreen technology, you're probably gonna get that schedule done uh, within a minute or a couple of extra seconds. So just so much so much easier to program. And just keep a note that the, the these numbers, the color didn't really transfer very well in our presentation, but like one and two are red, three and four are grayed out, which means they're not active. You see an X next to them. And then three and uh, then five and six are green, or I'm sorry, the, the dots are red, but you have the green check mark and then you can work through each day. So it's very, very simple, um, like night and day con considering that. So <laughs> yeah. hopefully we learned a little bit something about the importance of getting the thermos set up correctly. That's why we spent the time on this. And we, because a lot of the times we get phone calls, there's nothing wrong with the system. It's just that it's simply set wrong or the temperature limit is too low. And they had a tile floor, but they set it for laminate. Um, they wanted floor temperature, but they set ambient. If you set your floor, if you set your room to ambient, it's going to act really weird because your floor may, may feel warm when it's supposed to, it may not. Once again, the most important thing to do is 
schedule it and set it for floor temperature because that's going to give you the most reliable operation. So let's talk about testing before winter and what's going on with this slide. So testing before winter really gives you that uh, simple peace of mind knowing that your system is up and running, uh, it's uh, ready to maintain temperature, the day, time, schedule, uh, all these basic th things are set right. So uh, your simplest way to start your testing would be just get your unit up and running, dial the temperature to some higher number or to a particular set point that you usually uh, use during the winter, give it an hour or two, let that floor uh, gently warm up. If it's all nice and warm, sim simply speaking, that's all you need to do. Uh, you can always hit your ground fold uh, test button just to ensure your ground fold is functioning properly. It will once again give you that message that your ground fold uh, detected. Again, ignore it because you are the one who just hit that. So it's not like it just happened on its own. Just hit your side button, it will reset it, and you're good to go. So once again, the ground fault error. We have a question here from Brenda. And she says, if my control says ground fault error, should I be turning it off and getting an electrician to look at it? The simple answer to that is just try resetting the thermostat because you may have a nuisance trip. So what you can do there is you can press the button on the side uh, real short and see if it clears it. If it doesn't, you can press and hold the button down for five seconds. That'll turn the unit off. You can go to the breaker. You can turn the circuit breaker off for about 30 seconds, just like resetting a router. Turn your circuit breaker back on and then press and hold the button on the side of the thermostat for five seconds. That should kick it on nine times out of 10. If it doesn't clear it, then you may have a you, you may have trouble with the um, with the system uh, in the floor. So um, it's always going to come down to ohms. Whenever you have an issue and you find out that it's not your thermostat, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to do ohms testing on the floor. This ohms test can be done with a $15 digital ohm meter, voltmeter that you can buy at any big box store for under $20. And you don't want to get one of those analog ones. Don't waste your time. If it has a needle on the front, it's saying, no, 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 don't buy me because you do not want to use one of those. They're very difficult to use. So what you want to do is you want to go out and find a digital ohm meter that has a range where you can set the range with a knob on the front. You, you want to try to stay away from self-ranging meters. So that's what you want to take a look at. So we're going to talk about ohms. And this is going to answer a bunch of questions that we've already received. One question was from uh, uh, Arlene. Um, how do I detect if there's a break in the wire? It's by doing this test that we're going to show you right now. So Arlene, that is going to do that. We can send you the guide that shows you exactly how to do that. If you'd like, you can always give us a call. Um, Duane asks, I need to find a break or find out if I have a break in my floor that I installed long ago. Once again, ohms. And you don't have to rip up the floor to get to the ohms. The ohms that measurements you're going to be doing are going to be right at the back of the thermostat. So all you have to do is take the thermostat out of the wall, disconnect the, and turn the circuit breaker off, disconnect the wires coming from the floor up to the thermostat, and that's where you're going to be doing your test. You're not ripping anything up. You just take the thermostat out of the wall, killing the circuit breaker, and then disconnecting and testing the wires coming up from the floor. So that is uh, an answer to Dwayne's question. Also, Bill uh, asked the same question. My, I asked the floor to go to 78, but it's only getting to 72. Ohm's test. Um, and you can see that's the lion's, question, the lion's uh, share of the questions we get every day is, my floor isn't heating, what do I do? Test for ohms. So let's go ahead and talk about that. And um, let's see if there or any more questions. There's there's a couple questions on tap here. We're going to get to them, but uh, when we're going to talk about them, when we get to the I did it again. When we get to the um, section that we answer those. So it's about the um, the testing. There's two kinds of wires that we've sold historically: twin conductor and single conductor. Twin conductor goes back about 10 years, maybe a, a nine or 10 or 11 years. This is what, if you have a system that's less than 10 years old, this is what you have. So talk to us about this. 
Yeah, twin conductor system is, uh, you know, it's easy to recognize. You generally would have, especially if it's just one mat, you will have just one wire, kind of like as shown here, that will have two conductor inside, typically black and black on one side, yellow or red on the other side, and the ground sheathing that just kind of surrounds that. It will usually be hooked up to your house ground. The as soon as you see that type of combination of the wire, you know it's a twin conductor system and you simply would need to do three tests. You would test between those two conductors. That's gonna be your test or step number one. Then you will test between one conductor in the ground and the second conductor in the ground. So that's gonna be your test number two and test number three. These are the three main numbers that we need to get started and again, then as soon as you call us with those numbers, that's going to give us just like 90% of information to continue your troubleshooting. Yeah, and we'll ask people for their ohms readings, then they'll get back to us and they'll give us the reading across the black to yellow or the black to red, and then they'll stop. Well, that's only, as we can see, that's only a third of the information we need because testing from black to ground and testing from yellow or red to ground is going to tell us, that's very important, that's going to tell us if we have a short. So you can't just say yellow to black was this or red to black was this and be done. We want to find out if there's a short somewhere down the line because that's where you get GFCIs is a ground fault. It's seeing leakage going to ground. And that sometimes is a nuisance, but sometimes it's real. And the only way to find out a ground problem is to go from red to, red to ground, yellow to ground, or black to ground. So let's take a look, take, okay, memorize this cable, memorize what it looks like right now, because now we're going to move on to the next kind. And you can see there's a fundamental difference here between these wires. What's the difference? So now we're talking about a single conductor. Your main difference is that for one single mat, you're now gonna have two wires. And that's eventually why we call it single conductor because there's only one conductor in each wire. So it's almost like start and the end, right? You have two separate wires. The testing process will be very similar in a way because you're still really testing the same combination, the same information that you're trying to get. You're gonna test between the two conductors first, or I should say between two inner conductors. Then you're gonna test between the two outer ground sheathings here. So you can see that kind of your test number two, that's gonna be your ground to ground test. And then you're gonna do two more tests where you will take one wire and test it between the inner conductor and the outer sheathing and do identical thing on your second wire, test between inner conductor and the outer sheathing. So in this particular test with this type of system, you're gonna have four results, four numbers that we will need from you to once again get that full scope, to get that full piece of information. Yeah, in the old days, the mats, especially because we only sold mats back then for floor heating, is was it the 13-foot cable that ran to the beginning of the mat. Then there was a 26-foot cable designed to get from where that mat ended on the other side of the room and to run it back along the wall and to come up to the thermostat. Um, and that's where those two separate wires are, one from the front and one from the rear. So that's what we're going to be looking for. It's never just one reading, it's multiple readings. And we can send you that guide to show you how to do that. If you have problems with your floor heat, if you have GFI, if you're any of those things, Ohm's test is going to tell you a lot. And that's the first thing we're going to ask you anyway <laughs> when you call us. So you might as well have that because you go, I, you know, I watch those guys and Oh, that's right. I'm going to need ohms reading. So even if you went to our website at wormlyers.com and clicked in the word ohm in the search, that's O-H-M, in the search at the top of the screen, it'll give you the, the forms that you need to fill out to fix those or to find those. So how do you test? And once again, this is testing the environment system. This is our system that goes uh, under laminate, but it holds true for temp zone also. It also holds true for snow melt melting because all of our leads are pretty much uniform now and back in the day they were hodgepodge but now they're all pretty much the same they're going to follow the same color coding and they're going to look at the same because they're a single conductor system so testing the environment system let's talk about it real quick yeah so all of these products scott just mentioned these are all going to be twin conductor system approach you're going to have two conductors one ground you're going to do three tests so once again very 
uh, identical process to what we uh, just uh, watched in the you know two slide earlier. Once again, twin conductor testing, core to core, core to ground, second core to ground, and these are the three numbers that we need from you. Yeah, so it's very important. It's, and you can tell this is from the old days of when I was a hand model. Um, <laughs> you can see that I'm pointing to something there on the meter. And what I'm pointing to is the 200 range. Remember, we talked about the range setting on your on your uh, digital ohmmeter. Ideally, you want to have the 200 range so you can set the knob to 200 ohms. And you also want to have a knob that you can set to 20K ohms. 20K means 20,000. Because what would the 20,000 reading be for? Why would we need that? That would be a good setting to test the floor sensors. So uh, as soon as you hear K, and we talk about K ohms when we were talking about those sensors, remember 10K ohm, 12K ohm. So that's going to be that perfect uh, setting on your meter to, uh, to, to read the resistance on thousands and thousands of ohms. Right. So the one thing about, we talked about self-ranging meters, self-ranging meters there Achilles heel is they will usually find the 200 range stuff, but when you hook it up to your floor sensor, it'll say, I've got zero. I have OL or one. I have infinity. And, you know, Anatoly can tell you, we get that response all the time. And that's simply because the self-ranging meter hasn't found the 20K range. It doesn't know where to look. So if you do have one of those and you're stuck with a self-ranging meter, try pressing the range button while you're holding the wires on there. So get a friend hit range, 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 until it finds the right range manually. That's why we say get one of these inexpensive meters, you can set it to 200 or set it to 20K. Um, when we have some um, other questions, we break out the big tools. And what does this tool do? So that's a mega ohm tester. There's uh, there's like probably a good two or three more names for it. The insulation tester gonna be uh, another name, a more kind of nickname gonna be a mega. But what that tool does, it tests, it still tests resistance, right? It's still testing your resistance, but the uh, you know the fundamental difference here is that. This unit will send like a 500 volt signal between those two wires to test it precisely and to test it even if there is a tiny gap between the wires. The regular meter that we've just seen in the previous slide, that just uses a standard nine volt battery. So, you know, imagine a, a, a wire with some short and there is a, you know, microns, you know, few microns of gap between the wires. That nine volt battery not going to be enough to simply detect that. That 500 volt signal that the mega ohm tester will be sending will most likely going to be just uh, you know enough to jump through and detect and tell you yes there is a fault yes you have a short. Right, and that GFCI is doing is looking for leakage on the line. Leakage on the line means you have the two wires that are carrying voltage. We want to see if any of it leaks to the ground and that's what it's testing. Nine volts isn't enough to make it jump through that little gap like we talked about. And sometimes people will say their system works for about a half an hour until it gets hot and the GFIs. What's that? That's a good one. I actually didn't have that in a while, but yeah, that's, I mean, think about the electric heating wire. If it's cold, uh, it has one distance between those wires. Nothing moves, nothing changes and you're doing your test there's no short, everything feels fine, looks fine, right? As soon as you start turning on that system, that wire heats up and it just starts to expand. And eventually one string of that wire at a certain temperature touches the core wire. Eventually the core and ground short appears and it trips. So again, with the temperature, things are changing. And that's where, once again, that mega ohm testing can be very handy to kind of confirm or deny that particular uh, issue. So um, Asia or Asia, or I'm not, I'm, I apologize if you're watching, if I mispronounced your name, I, I, I'm sorry, but uh, this person has a great question. Why are only certain spots on my floor warm while others are cold? And that means that you're walking across the floor and there's a cold area there, a cold area. Not if you have a giant installation and half of your floor is cold and half of it's hot. We know what that is. It's because one 
cable or one mat isn't heating up. But if if you're walking across the floor and you feel a cold spot, then a warm spot and a cold spot, this is a call that is pretty much answered by getting a tool that's going to let you see this. And what tool is that? That would be a thermal camera or thermal imaging device. Pretty much, you know, once again, few names in the industry for that, but it's the device that gives you that visual picture of what the surface temperature is. So simple example on, on the uh, image on the upper right here, you can see kind of the heating coil and you see the spot that is like bright red, almost white. That just simply means, you know, that one spot is uh, almost 66 degrees, while the rest of the floor is roughly in 50s. So once again, it, that's that's a great tool, that imaging device, to find these kind of to find that heat signature, to find this temperature difference. So if we take a look at the top in, uh, picture, and we take a look at the bottom picture, what is the bottom picture rec uh, representing? Bottom picture seems to be like a uh, a good heating element that heats up throughout the whole length, at least to the you know through the range we see on the picture. But you can clearly see that this heating element is very likely not installed right. There is uh, cold spots. There is uneven kind of coverage, uneven installation, and that's going to be a immediate direct result uh, why there might be certain spots that are cold. If you see on that scale kind of to the right, you can see that blue bluish area on the upper left is like 69 degrees, while the rest of the floor is nice and warm in about 86, 85 degrees. Yes, that's going to be very noticeable. And once again, that's just most likely improper installation. And that's literally, these cold areas are literally two or maybe three inches apart from the hot hot area. So this is why you can't put a, a heated mat in the center of a room and expect it to heat the whole floor. It won't do that. You only get heat where there's heating cable. And you can see that we're going from the mid 80s here to the 70s here, inch, an inch or two away. This is definitely a, a sign of a poorly installed job where there's too much space. If you buy one of our heated uh, rolls, that uh, our temp zone heated rolls, that's why the wire is attached every three inches because it gives you uniform spacing. The temperature really only maybe goes about an inch to an inch and a half laterally from the wire. So if you have two wires three inches apart, you're going to have a nice even spread, an inch and a half from this wire and an inch and a half from this wire. And that's what gives you a nice, a warm area and you can see down here in the right corner where it's installed correctly. You can see how that's all a nice warm area. Here we get to the blue spots where it's cold. So for people that aren't uh, very experienced at reading thermal images, this thermal image on the top is actually what it does is it overlays a, a real picture with the picture of the thermal uh, uh, image. And if we look really carefully here, we can see some lines going from side to side and up and down that are kind of darker than the rest of, of the floor. So I'm talking about if you can see a line here, then there's a line here. What is this picture representing? So I can definitely see uh, nice square tiles here, and those lines will be the grout lines. So what happens in grout lines? Why is the grout line a dead giveaway as to what's happening here? So yeah, on this picture, just to kind of jump in a little bit ahead, on this picture, we have we are kind of like in the middle of the troubleshooting, and there is a hot spot detected. As just like we discussed before, you can see that bright red, almost white uh, signature. That's your hot spot that was uh, you know that was shown to us as a result of using the troubleshooting tools. But that spot is shown right on the grout line, meaning that there was damage down to that uh, cable. And it's, you know, nine times out of 10, that damage was done when cleaning the grout. And, you know, uh, that sharp uh, tool knife was just uh, slicing that cable. That's, that's, again, that's what most likely happened here. So there's a difference between, you know, uh, installation damage and the incorrect installation. We've got one of each here. What we actually do here is I think we actually have heated up a short and where the short 
goes, you can see that the wire goes, okay, back and forth, back and forth, and gets to a spot and stops. That's usually what happens when we're heating a short. We're going to be talking about that here in just a little bit. And here are the magic tools. These tools are very, very expensive. Most people don't have these tools, but we do. So if someone has a problem with their floor, they've done the ohms readings and find out that they have a short or find out that they have an open circuit, that means something's going on in the floor. The number one misconception that we get from people when they have even the smallest problem with their floor is they immediately think, oh, geez, I'm going to have to rip up my entire floor and reinstall it. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth. You do not need to rip up your floor if you run into a problem. That's what these tools are for. These tools will let you find that specific problem. And you can see we can actually lit up this one, two, may, uh, probably two tiles here, make this repair, and the system is working again. So we're not ripping up the whole floor. We're ripping up one or two tiles. So describe to us what these parts are and what they do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, digital multimeter, I'm going to start with the easiest one because we already covered that. That's your number one tool to get things started, to understand if you're dealing with a break, that's really step number one. And then understand if you're dealing with like a complete break, like an open circuit, or maybe it's a short circuit when you have that resistance between a core wire and a ground wire. So if you do have a short circuit, your simplest method to, uh, to approach that would be to heat up that short circuit with a variac transformer. The variac transformer just uh, has a dial on the top and you can simply send a low voltage electricity into that short circuit and achieve the exactly effect we were uh, showing on that thermal image a moment ago. You're simply going to heat up the short. You're going to easily see that with the thermal camera and hopefully be done with, with, with that type of a problem within, within an hour or two. Right. So just to interrupt uh, real quickly, yeah, yeah. normally normally to get floor heat, you're going to be testing across the red and the black or the yellow and the black to, to make the floor heat. If you have a short circuit, what you're doing is you're actually setting up a heating circuit between one of those wires and ground. You're hooking them together. And that's what's causing it to heat up to that spot. So you're not hooking up red and red and black. You're heating up red to ground or black to ground and that's what's going to make it stop at that particular spot so what's the high pot tester for so high pot tests are going to be the tool you would uh typically be using or starting to use if you do not have a short circuit and you simply need to create one or you need to just create a hot spot and the high pot tester is uh you know a, a tool that sends up to 2,500 volts of electricity. So first of all, that's not the tool that, you know, an average homeowner want to get and just start troubleshooting the floor. You want to have a licensed electrician working with that. And simply by supplying these short, uh, short bursts of electricity, like two seconds on, two seconds off, you can get that uh, gap, that break or that fault arcing. And every time it arcs, it generates heat. So again, maybe five, 10, 15 minutes of that arcing will give you that heat signature again, or it may just create a short and then you switch to a variac transformer. Perfect, so let's take a look at the old way of troubleshooting, which kind of doesn't really do a lot for us these days, except to tell us if it, the problem's at the beginning of the cable or at the end, because that's about all it's worth these days if you don't have an installation plan. If you have an installation plan, we can use it. However, the other tools that we showed can find and show you the exact spot. This tool will only give you an approximation of where it is. So if you put this and if you use this tool, this says, i testing this wire. We have instructions that show you how to do this. I'm going to test this wire. It says the problem is 16 feet away. I know the problem is right around the thermostat somewhere. If, if it tells me the fault is 270 feet away, that tells me it's on the other side of the room. And that's where I'm going to take my thermal camera and look. I'm going to take my camera and look in that area. This isn't really going to help me locate the spot. It's not a toner. Toners don't really work with, with troubleshooting floors. We get that question all the time toner and the answer to that is no you're not going to get any results with a toner so that's what this tool does it limits your ability to find it by just saying it's at the beginning or it's at the end of the wire so let's talk about 
uh, identifying the location with the tools. Now, uh, go ahead and talk about this slide. Yeah, so uh, it's always good to repeat, you know, with those high voltage tools, you really want to have an electrician working with that. And uh, following one of those methods we uh, just described, eventually you can uh, pinpoint that good spot or that maybe one tile or two tiles where the problem is, get that tile removed. You can always redo the test because it doesn't really take much time. You can redo the test and get even more clear, more sharp and precise uh, spot where where that is like in this particular, uh, you know, in this particular layer of thin set. So doing that will really give you that uh, exact location so you know where to chisel out the more of that thin set, get the wire repaired and be done with that. Great. Now that leads into one of the questions we had <clears throat> uh, uh, from Arlene. Arlene has um, had a spot like this. Uh, she had a system for many years. Two years ago, one side of the floor heated, one side of it didn't. We're going to talk about that here in just a couple slides. But um, she got the equipment before uh, to find the break and they took ceramic tile. Um, what we see is once people get this uh, and they do the repair, there there's a couple of things that can happen afterwards, causing it to fail again. And one of them is you can only find one spot at a time using this tool. You're going to find the first weak spot and you can repair it. And then you test it to make sure the rest of the mat is good. If you don't do that test, if you find the spot, you assume that's the only spot that there is, you make your repair and put the tile back down. And then you come back a week later and that side doesn't work. It's telling you that we saw a picture of that where, you, where they cut into the grout line. It could be there's another spot that was a little weak and then you know, it has now failed, or it could be that the repair that was done has failed. Um, I've gone out personally, repaired dozens of those where the repair that was done was done with electrical tape. I'm not saying this job was, but I'm just saying people that I've followed and I've repaired product after, um, I've repaired many repairs. Um, so what has happened is one of two things probably. The, possibly the repair has failed, it worked for a while and then it quit, or the bad spot was found they stopped and they fixed it and then they covered it up, but they didn't know at that point that there was another problem somewhere down the line. So what it's going to come down to, Arlene, is doing ohms again. We're going to start all over again with ohms and we're going to find that next spot and we're going to fix it. Or maybe it's the same spot and fix it. So that's what we're going to do with that. And you have the more, I, we want you to give us a call at um, our toll free number we'll be glad to answer that question for you and work with you to continue to find that spot so very very good question there thank you so let's go on to this next slide and we're, we're running out of time so we're going to try to to make this as succinct as possible um how does the variac and thermal camera work together this is going to be for a short yeah, yeah, that's a that's almost uh, just a more schematical uh, representation of that picture we were showing earlier. But yeah, we heating a short, meaning that we just supplying the low voltage between your main wire and the ground wire. It creates a circuit. It heats to a point where that short is. It's not going to heat past that point. So the easiest way to find it, you're going to see that you know outline of your heating wire. It's going, 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 and then it just stops. No more heat after that. The point where it stops is the point you want to mark it with a piece of tape because that's where the short is. Now, what I like to do is I like to look at this screen because this one looks a lot like that, but it's not the same issue, is it? Yeah, that definitely does not look as uh, like a same issue. And that seems to me like a normal system that actually works just fine, but something was not done right here in terms of planning. And... Uh, of course, a simple hint, which we already show in the picture, is that on your upper left area, uh, or sorry, on the upper uh, left side of the picture here is non-insulated area, meaning that there was a floor heating system installed throughout the whole room, but that particular corner was uh, not covered with the insulation first. So on, a result, slab, on a yeah, concrete slab. On a concrete slab. on a concrete slab, of yeah, course. That's the good uh, one, yeah. And... Uh, that's where you can see that you have that immediate effect. Your floor heating in that area still works, but it just doesn't heat the surface to the temperature as the rest of the floor. 
So this is where people say, why do I really need that Cerasorb? I've got a, I'm gonna put this on my basement floor. Do I really need it? Well, do you want a floor that feels not cold? Or do you want to feel a, warm, a floor that feels warm? It's completely up to you. But if you don't put insulation down, you're not going to get the temperature response that you're looking for. So now we have a question. Uh, we had a question earlier about one side of my floor works and one side doesn't. Not cold spots, but one whole side doesn't work and one whole side does. That's what the next three uh, slides are going to do. And what do we see here? Yeah, nine, I would say again, nine times out of 10, that type of question will all will be valid when there is a system with multiple heating mats. Let's just make it simple and call it two heating mats. Uh, if it's two heating mats, you still can have a very high chance. Your thermostat is working, everything is right there. Your mat number one is working because you know we know a part of your system works, uh, but the other half or the other side of the floor is not working because it's covered by another mat and that mat may just have a problem or maybe that mat is not connected i mean one of those things so once again circling back doing the ohm test so how do you know if it's a problem with the control or the product in the floor ohms it's always coming down ohms remember that word ohm go to warmleaders.com Com, put it in the search field and you'll see everything there is to know about ohms. So that's where you're going to see where this product is. There's possibly this product. You can see there's a thermostat over here and the thermostat controls a couple of other or a few other power modules because this is such a big installation. The thermostat can only handle 15 amps. So every other 15 amps that you have in the floor has to be controlled separately with another control. These talk to each other with a low voltage connection, but they need to have their own individual power supply coming from the circuit breaker. So if we looked at this particular job, there's one, two, three, four controls. That means four circuit breakers feeding this, but they all need to talk to each other. So let's talk about how they talk to each other, because if they don't talk to each other, one will come on and off, on and off, and the other ones will just sit there and not do anything. And this is why. Explain to us what's here. Yeah, so uh, on this diagram, we can see that all the way to the left, that's the uh, thermostat. Uh, unit that's your main control that's what you're going to be using to do all of your interaction and setup and everything and uh, the two units to the right are those power module devices that sort of handle that additional load additional 15 amps additional 15 amps and uh, on the lower portion of that diagram you can see the front of these uh, devices of the thermostat and the modules and there are four terminals a b c and d the let's start with a very simple the c and d is eventually where you connect your floor sensor you just connect it there you're done with that you have a and b left so a and b is what you're going to be using to connect it to the power module and the uh, important part here don't just grab two wires connected a a and b to c and d on the next unit you want to follow the polarity you want to connect the wire from terminal a to terminal C and from wire from terminal B to terminal D like Delta. That way you have the right wiring. And now if you do that, the same approach from first module, which is in the middle here to the second module, which is on the right, you're now gonna have the whole system working together as just one large system. So as soon as you come home, you dial your, dial your temperature up, the whole system comes on. Now, what if somebody calls up and says, my floor, when I turn the thermostat on, this part's really warm, but the other side is cold. When the thermostat turns off, the other start, part starts to heat up. There's something cockamamie, something completely blowing my mind. <laughs> what could possibly, is my house going to catch on fire? Am I going to, is a meteor going to hit us? What is causing this to happen? That would be very likely the concern when uh, the low voltage wiring that I just discussed that A to C, B to D was not followed. In other words, when wire from A is maybe by mistake connected to D and wire from B connected to C. So that's when those two sides of the system or those two devices are gonna be sort of doing the opposite, opposite thing. Yeah, yeah, just opposite operation. One turns off, the other one turns on. One turns on, the other turns off. That's because it's wired backwards. And we get this all the time. 
all the time we get this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into a couple really easy troubleshooting things, and then we're going to wrap up. So there are some hard and fast rules when it comes to these thermostats. We've sold these thermostats for 20 20 plus years, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them out there. They last forever. But when they don't last forever, there's some dead giveaways to what is causing the problem with the floor. So talk about this thermostat. Um, I like to call it the PB112 because that's what people see when they take the faceplate off. They see PB112, which stands for power base. But what's the thermostat really called? The thermostat is called the, it's a TH115 series. We also called it smart stat. Uh, that's just gonna be another kind of indications or names that you can identify it. Of course, simple way to identify, or, you know, if you're trying to call us and tell us about that unit, just tell us that's the unit with the door on, on the left and the right side. We'll know right away what uh, model you're talking about. But uh, as Scott mentioned, the easiest kind of symptoms or information you can give us would be uh, just a typical operation, like what happens with the unit. And, you know, if it's a unit that is 10 years old, and like Scott said, those we have those tons of these units in the fields that are operating just fine for 20 plus years. But if you call us and tell us, I have this number 14.2, then 15.1, then everything flashes up and the same thing cycles over and over, we just historically knows that's a, a historical symptom that we know that the unit just needs to be replaced, that just something went wrong with electronics or it's, again, there is no exact explanation for it. It's but that's, booting up. It's booting yeah, up over and over and over It's just rebooting again. over and yeah. over. And we just know this unit needs to be replaced. There's nothing you can fix. There's nothing you can reset with that. Uh, another probably uh, number one or number two scenario that could happen, you know, it's a fall time here. Everybody's starting the unit on. Uh, you found uh, that on-off switch behind the, uh, the left side door. You turn it to on, nothing happens. The screen stays blank. Uh, the first thing you want to do, go check out your breaker. Reset it. Maybe the breaker is off. Maybe the breaker was tripped. Reset it first. Make sure there's power to it. If it's still blank, again, very likely you have the unit that needs to be replaced. Uh, we would always suggest if you want to verify that you can check your incoming power just again, just to make sure you got power there. And again, nine times out of 10, you would be replacing that unit as well. Right. And we don't sell just the bases. We don't sell just the face plates. You have to buy them together. We don't sell them separately. And we suggest we have newer units we talked about before. You can see that this is pretty, um, it's old technology, difficult to program we suggest getting a new touch thermostat because they are so much easier. So let's talk about the people that usually call us up that are the most forlorn. And these are the people that have a thermostat that doesn't pass the floor sensor um, uh, test at the beginning. And these are the people that forgot to take the thermostat out of the thermostat box and reach behind it and take out the floor sensor. These are the people that they go to put the thermostat in and find out that the thermostat's there and so is this blue black coil. What is this black coil and why is my floor not heating? Why is it giving me an error? They have forgotten to install the floor sensors. What can they do? So yeah, if the sensor is not installed, once again, that's not the end of the world. You don't need to rip up the floor. You don't need to abandon your system. You still can operate it. And there are a few kind of stages on how you can approach to that. First of all, if you just want to verify if your system is working, you can change, go into your setting, change your system to that ambient or room temperature mode and overshoot your current room temperature that will activate the heat, give it some time, the floor will warm up. That's going to be your number one indication that yes, your floor heat is working. Stage two is now to retrofit that sensor into the ground line and you're going to be 100% ready to go. So when you're doing this retrofitting it, you want to make sure that what you need to go line out, you need to make sure you don't go too deep. If you go too deep, you're going to cut the wire and then you're going to be lifting that tile to fix it. So get that grout line routed out. We have a sensor specifically designed to fit in real small grout lines. As you can see here, it'll fit right into that spot and then you can grout over the top of it. 
So that's what you can do. The most important thing is though, to turn the system on, find out where the heated area is and make sure that sensor is out into the heated area. Doesn't need to be out in the middle of the floor. Just follow that grout line into the heated area and that's where you wanna set it. So at this point, we have presented a whole bunch of information and we have had a lot of people stick around. We appreciate you sticking around for this long presentation because it's real nitty gritty. It's the stuff that you're going to see every day if you do a lot of these floors. So if you have any questions, please ask them and we'll be glad to answer them. And uh, Olivia is keeping an eye on our Facebook feed to make sure that there are any questions there that need to be answered. Um, I'm going to go through the answers, the questions from ahead of time. Um, and I think we've addressed all of those. Um, yes. So uh, let's go to one of the questions we have here. And uh, this is Brent. Brent says, what is the most energy efficient way to program the floor? Should I start warming earlier at a lower temperature or wait until I'm about to use the space and setting it at a higher temperature? Or should I keep the minimum temperature higher and only raise it a little and when I'm going to use the room? And it's a pretty common question. You want to heat it when you're needing it and you don't want to heat it when you don't need it. Right. And what would you say, Anatoly? Yeah, great. Uh, I, I, there's really not much to add after what you said, but uh, the one thing I definitely want to add is that with those newer units, the good thing about them is that you actually don't need to sort of guess or preheat or set it to a lower temperature earlier because uh, those units have uh, what's called adaptive function. It actually, no, you know, as, as, as long as you're using the schedule, of course, it knows what is your next temperature at what time you want it so it will start to preheat it based on what's that floor temperature now so like if it's you know if you want a nice and warm temperature in the morning but you know it's a you know an hour earlier and the floor is 15 degrees lower yes it's probably going to start to preheat it early in advance to get to that temperature you want but then of course if it's you know if it's in more warmer days and your temperature is simply two, three, four degrees lower than what you want, it's probably gonna just kick on your system five, 10 minutes in advance and you're gonna be good to go. So once again, as long as you're using a schedule and you have that adaptive function turned on, I would just recommend simply setting your schedule at the temperature you want and at the time you want. You don't need to sort of estimate or, or uh, you know, set an earlier time. In the old days, you used to have to go, okay, I want it to be warm by six, so I better start it at five. You don't have to do that. You say, I want it to be this temperature at this time, and the thermostat figures out how long it takes to get to that temperature, and it will back time to that spot and start it then. So it's your choice between it will be warm at the time you choose, or it will start heating at the time you choose. You want it to be warm at the time you choose. That's the adaptive function. So that's what is automatically set on the system. So hopefully that answered your question there. And that is all the questions. Olivia, do we have any questions from the Facebook feed? It does not look like I see that Olivia chatted us that uh, there's no more questions on the Facebook. We seems to be good to go. Okay, so uh, let's talk about um, our next webinar. Our next webinar is going to be called Learn How to Install all electric, electric floor heating with luxury vinyl tile or any vinyl type product that's going to be Thursday at 1 p.m. Central Time on November 10th. Um, that's seeking up on us, isn't it? Uh, you can also join us daily for our, um, our webinar topics. We do it Monday through Friday, sometimes twice a day. There's our schedule. And we talk about a bunch of different things. If you have questions, you can just join us at those times. Those times are all Central Time. So we do have a monthly promotion this month, and that is 25% off of select towel warmers. Visit warmlyours.com to get those 25% off towel warmers. Perfect gift idea. Perfect gift idea for um, the holiday season. Uh, also, we love to talk. In case you haven't noticed it, we love to talk. We love <laughs> to talk about radiance and heat. Um, that's part of our problem. We love this stuff. We love to be warm. We love to talk. It's a match made in heaven. Evans. But we would love to talk about what you're interested in. So please let us know what you're interested in by filling out your uh, questionnaire when you get it from us. And we would love to talk about things that interest you, not just things that we go, hmm, maybe we should talk about that this month. Tell us what you'd like to talk about and we'll be glad to talk about it. So you can contact us anytime. Our phone number is 800-875-5285. 
You can email us at the email addresses there, and you can also check us out. We're on just about any social platform that you can think of. Um, I'm still working on the MySpace page, so I'll let you know when that's <laughs> done. And um, you can also check us out at warmlyyours.com. So we really appreciate you coming to visit us today. And thanks for sticking around and watching most of our presentation. So we'd like to say our goodbyes now. So I want to say until next time, stay warm. And be radiant, guys. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.